Happy Thanksgiving! If you hear some water sounds in the background, it's because we just got our one day of rain per year here in California. Today I'll be continuing with part two of Self-Made Men by Frederick Douglass. I like doing the first part and I'm looking forward to this as well. I'll be reading pages five, six, and seven from the speech as it appears in the Library of Congress, link in the description. Seeing as there are 39 pages in the lecture, it looks like I'll have about 13 total episodes at the rate I'm going, uh, and it will take me the rest of the way through Voice Vember. That's okay with me, because this thing is cool. <clears throat> this natural reverence for all that is great in man and this tendency to deify and worship him, though natural and the source of man's elevation, has not always shown itself wise, but has often shown itself far otherwise than wise. It has often given us a wicked ruler for a righteous one, a false prophet for a true one, a corrupt preacher for a pure one, and a man of war for a man of peace, and a distorted and vengeful image of God for an image of justice and mercy. But it is not my purpose to attempt here any comprehensive and exhaustive theory or philosophy of the nature of manhood in all the range I have indicated. I am here to speak to you of a peculiar type of manhood under the title of self-made men. That there is, in more respects than one, something like a solecism in this title, I freely admit. Properly speaking, there are in the world no such men as self-made men. That term implies an individual independence of the past and present which can never exist. Our best and most valued acquisitions have been obtained either from our contemporaries or from those who have preceded us in the field of thought and discovery. We have all either begged, borrowed, or stolen. We have reaped where others have sown, and that which others have strewn, we have gathered. It must in truth be said, though it may not accord well with the self-conscious individuality and self-conceit, that no possible native force of character and no depth or wealth of originality can lift a man into the absolute independence of his fellow men, and no generation of men can be independent of the preceding generation. The brotherhood and interdependence of mankind are guarded and defended at all points. I believe in individuality, but individuals are, to the mass, like waves to the ocean. The highest order of genius is as dependent as is the lowest. It, like the loftiest waves of the sea, derives its power and greatness from the grandeur and vastness of the ocean of which it forms a part. We differ as the waves, but are one as the sea. To do something well does not necessarily imply the ability to do everything else equally well. If you can do in one direction that which I cannot do, I may, in another direction, be able to do that which you cannot do. Thus, the balance of power is co kept comparatively clean, even, and a self-acting brotherhood and interdependence is maintained. Nevertheless, the title of my lecture is eminently descriptive of a class, and is, moreover, a fit and convenient one for my purpose in illustrating the idea which I have in view. In the order of discussion, I shall adopt the style of an old-fashioned preacher and have a firstly, a secondly, a thirdly, a fourthly, and, possibly, a conclusion. My first is, who are self-made men? My second is, what is the true theory of their success? My third is, the advantages which self-made men derive from the manners and institutions of their surroundings. And my fourth is, 
the grounds of the criticism to which they are, as a class, especially exposed. On the first point, I may say that, by the term self-made men, I mean especially what, to the popular mind, the term itself imports. Self-made men are the men who, under peculiar difficulties and without the ordinary helps of favoring circumstances, have attained knowledge, usefulness, power, and position, and have learned from themselves the best uses to which life can be put in this world, and in the exercise of these uses to build up worthy character. They are the men who owe little or nothing to birth, relationship, family surroundings, to wealth inherited, or to early approved means of education, who are what they are without the aid of any of the favoring conditions by which other men usually rise in the world and achieve great results. In fact, they are the men who are not brought up who are not brought up, but who are obliged to come up, not only without the voluntary assistance or friendly cooperation of society, but often in open derision in open and derisive defiance of all the efforts of society and the tendency of circumstances to repress, retard, and keep them down. They are the men who, in a world of schools, academies, colleges, and other institutions of learning, are often compelled by unfriendly circumstances to acquire their education elsewhere and, amidst unfavorable conditions, to hew out for themselves a way to success, and thus to become the architects of their own good fortunes. They are, in a peculiar sense, indebted to themselves for themselves. If they have traveled far, they have made the road on which they have traveled. If they have ascended high, they have built their own ladder. From the depths of poverty, such as these have often come. From the heartless pavements of large and crowded cities, barefooted, homeless, and friendless, they have come. From hunger, rags, and destitution, they have come. Motherless and fatherless, they have come and may come. Flung overboard in the midnight storm on the broad and tempest-tossed ocean of life, Left without ropes, planks, oars, or life preservers, they have bravely buffeted the frowning billows and have risen in safety and life, where others, supplied with the best appliances for safety and success, have fainted, despaired, and gone down forever. Such men as these, whether found in one position or another, whether in the college or in the factory, whether professors or plowmen, whether Caucasian or Indian, whether Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-African, are self-made men and are entitled to a certain measure of respect for their success and for proving to the world the grandest possibilities of human nature, of whatever variety of race or color. Okay, that is all for today. I'm really loving this speech so far, uh, though he does weaken his argument somewhat by saying that there are no self-made men, properly speaking. It seems to imply that the standard of what counts as self-made is something along the lines of achieved wealth and fame with literally no contact with a single other human ever, which he readily acknowledges is an impossible standard. He does give a great definition of a self-made man later in the passage I read, so he doesn't need to give credence to this straw man form. As an example of why this formulation is incoherent, consider what the ultimate independent version of starting a successful business would look like. It would be a company without employees, suppliers, advisors, or customers, which is obviously contradictory on its face. Granted, this is kind of a minor point and doesn't detract much from his overall argument. I bring it up because I think he would have been better off 
by rejecting the ultimate independence concept as impossible and therefore irrelevant, rather than as some type of unattainable ideal. Anyway, that's all for tonight. Pretend to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll have more tomorrow.